last time uh, that we discussed about the multilingual uh, the ASR, and then uh, the, they see the kind of lot of potential or actually kind of a uh, uh, lot of benefits of using the end-to-end -end ASR uh, for the multilingual speech recognition applications. And then at that time, I mentioned that the, uh, the this is uh, thanks to the, uh, the third item, uh, it's uh, can be, we can build a speech recognition without expert knowledge. Uh, in this case is that uh, the, uh, the, the uh, dictionary, right? And uh, yes, the, it is not easy to get a dictionary. And in this case, uh, we actually cannot easily build speech recognition for some uh, specific languages. So this is what we learned uh, last time. But actually, uh, this kind of property always has a pros and cons. And the, uh, the, what I didn't explain the last time uh, the, was that uh, actually this classical speech recognition pipeline is not very bad for the multilingual speech recognition. So please check uh, this kind of pipeline again, feature extraction, acoustic modeling. Um, sorry. Yes, feature extraction, acoustic modeling, lexicon, language modeling. And especially this lexicon part is a kind of a difficult uh, for some languages. And then end-to-end uh, -end actually making it simple by using a single model so that we don't have to use lexicon. Uh, that is kind of a, one of the benefits we have explained before. However, um, we, to train speech recognition system in such kind of a, 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 a methodology, we always have to have our pair data of the speech and the corresponding uh, transcriptions to uh, build speech recognition and so on. So English cases, again, it's easy. O and the W, we can easily prepare. But uh, if we are moving to very other minor low resource languages, even it is just very difficult to uh, uh, prepare the pair data and then uh, the how to make it. And actually one of the approach is using this part, uh, form or phoneme representation. So this is actually language independent. Uh, if we're using some kind of standardized uh, the, the language independent form representation like our uh, the IPA, uh, International Form Association, uh, based uh, the phoneme, uh, the symbol, and so on. And then uh, the, we can actually uh, the separate the problem. First, from here to here, speech to phoneme, phoneme uh, this can be any language, right? Uh, the phone uh, the, the, does not specify the languages. So uh, we first actually make uh, the, the, uh, the acoustic model by uh, the only using the uh, speech and the corresponding form, and it's any languages, the, the, the English or Japanese or Mandarin or Hindi or whatever, uh, we just kind of combine and always, you know, instead of uh, the making this as a target, always using form as a target, uh, and then we can actually building this acoustic model part, right? And then lexicon, Yes, uh, uh, we just using the help uh, from the linguist. They actually are actively working on try to make uh, this uh, the, the lexicon for many of the minor uh, the, the low resource languages and so on. It's not easy to uh, the collect the data, but it's not difficult to investigate and provide making a, a lexicon. So there are actually a lot of resources uh, for many languages uh, for the lexicon part. And then after that, uh, this part, uh, lexicon to the language model, we only require the text data, right? So uh, by using uh, this kind of methodology, we could actually uh, build uh, the uh, speech recognition uh, for some specific languages without using the parallel data. So in this case, again, that we just are uh, using the machine learning at a deep neural network to build the acoustic models, get the help uh, from the other uh, linguists. Uh, the, there are a lot of kind of uh, uh, the, uh, the people actually uh, the, the building such kind of lex lexicon for many of the languages. And then if we have some kind of uh, their uh, the, the text data, 
we can also build in the language model. And then without using the pair data, we could actually making the speech recognition system. So this is actually one of the other, other CMU's work. And they, uh, with this kind of methodology, uh, the, can you guess how many languages we can now deal with? I say we cannot, you know, fully making it, but it's with this kind of uh, methodology, we can make it uh, the possible. And now we are building the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the massive multilingual speech recognition. And how many languages that, uh, do you think uh, that we are dealing with? Actually, the next slide has some answers, so please do not check it. Or people checking it, <laughs> do not answer. Uh, do you guys guess how many? Okay, so hint that we have usually have 7,000 uh, languages or 8,000 languages, depending on who counts. And the commercial proper, uh, the product uh, probably up to around 100. And, and the methods are the massive multilingual speech, uh, which are the, the they claim to kind of de dealing with the 1,000 languages. Okay, the other, uh, I can uh, the, give you the answer. The answer is that we actually the, the, uh, try to handle 2,000 languages. Yeah, exactly, more exactly 1,900, <laughs> 190005 or something like that. So uh, this is again that uh, by using the, uh, this methodology, and also, uh, this is not only our effort. A lot of uh, the, the linguists and so on actually uh, the, the making the, uh, the great resources. And then by collecting these, we could actually add a handle to uh, the, the deal with the, the, the uh, 2,000 languages. But of, of course, you know, this is not perfect uh, since we don't have enough data and so on. By the way, even we cannot test it. <laughs> Uh, because in uh, most cases, we actually don't have audio data. <laughs> and just, you know, lexicon and some kind of a part of the text data, and then we build it. So we are not sure this kind of language is, is really working and so on. Uh, but anyway, by using this kind of our other project uh, 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 direction, uh, we are actually uh, dealing with the 2,000 <laughs> uh, the, the languages. Uh, and uh, uh, by the way, we cannot uh, uh, extend uh, from 2000 uh, to more languages, even we have our uh, 7000 languages. Can you know that, that, that why we cannot extend anymore? Do you know the answer for this? It's actually quite uh, uh, the obvious. Uh, the, up to 2000, uh, some languages have scripts. But uh, the rest of the 5000 languages only spoken languages. So if, for example, uh, we use you know, the phoneme, phone, uh, that we could uh, define the ASR task, but generally since they don't have a script, so we actually even cannot define the speech question task for these languages. So this uh, the 5,000 languages, probably we should try to map it to the phone symbol, or we try to use the speech translation and they are uh, the, the, uh, the converting to the some of the uh, other languages. That would be probably we can do uh, for the rest of the 5,000 languages. And uh, again, we are actually actively uh, working on this, uh, the multilingual uh, speech recognition uh, the programs. In addition to this work, we also recently uh, the launched the new uh, the, the, uh, the benchmark, uh, which is multilingual speech processing universal performance benchmark, uh, the ML SPARB. And I will actually explain a bit about this the SPARB project later if I have time. But this is a kind of extended uh, uh, the version of the SPARB pro project for the multilingual side. And this is not the, uh, the fully aligned with this one. This is more for the end-to-end -end ASR side. But we actually are uh, working on the 100, uh, starting from the 143 language as a benchmark, and then now expanding it to 154, and gradually uh, the, the making this uh, the, to the uh, very large number to uh, the cover uh, the many of the languages 
our other uh, research uh, and the development uh, other platforms. Okay, so uh, that's the, the the rest of the part that I did I couldn't uh, explain it there. Uh, but anyway, the multilingual ASR, uh, the uh, there are kind of a lot of activities now, but mostly these kind of activities are not only from the uh, the speech researchers. It's also from the lot of uh, the the uh, the contribution uh, in the other uh, language side. And then uh, we can actually uh, making a uh, uh, significant uh, advance in this kind of multilingual uh, error. And the, I explained the uh, multilingual as a kind of uh, the, the can be one of the simple uh, direction of uh, just mixing everything and then doing the, uh, the, the, uh, the multilingual uh, speech recognition. And then uh, the, I explained this one. But another trend is actually given this kind of uh, the multilingual speech condition, further fine tuning is actually another possibility, which I will explain if I have time uh, the, in today's meeting, uh, today's uh, the, the lecture. And the uh, uh, this uh, the, the, uh, the direction is again, the, there are a lot of uh, difficulties in data. Uh, just finding the data is difficult. Uh, even we found the data, some of the data has a sensitive kind of information or uh, the license and so on. Uh, the correction is also uh, very important. Uh, and uh, the data is quite noisy in these cases. So uh, the, the, the cleaning is also a uh, very difficult, uh, challenging problem. And the, again, our team is not only just building the speech uh, recognition for the many languages, we are actually also working on the this uh, data collection uh, part as well. So that's the, about the uh, multilingual speech recognition. Any questions? Okay, sounds good. And then uh, the move to the today's part. Uh, just uh, the, let me uh, the show you some introduction of today's part, and then would like to pass it to the other uh, Ethan. So today I will uh, the talk about, about the second part of the, uh, the advanced topic in end-to-end -end ASR. And the, today I will talk about the, uh, the foundation models. Now, you know, there are a lot of foundation models in the uh, image, uh, the text and so on, right? And the speech also has other uh, the foundation models. There are already ongoing activities where people are also trying to kind of expand this one. And the CMU is actually uh, working on this area uh, quite uh, the, the actively. And the, uh, there is actually a blog post that we recently made uh, for the, uh, the foundation uh, models. So I just put a link in the, uh, the, um, in the uh, slide. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, the yeah we call it foundation for speech foundation models, and uh, we just uh, the listing four items, uh, which including the MLS pub that I mentioned before, and the self supervised speech representation that I may explain it if I have uh, the sufficient time, and the data collection part, uh, uh, the the uh, the four hundred twenty k hours of untainted uh, multilingual data. Uh, which I have mentioned that, that we are also working on it. And another part is uh, deproducing uh, the whisper style of uh, the speech models. And that is actually uh, the one of the our recent uh, other activities and want to uh, pass it to the uh, event. Yes. Okay. So in this part of the presentation, uh, I will introduce one of our recent efforts towards building a speech foundation model. And this model we call it OSEN. It stands for an open whisper style speech model. And this is the first large scale uh, speech foundation model from the academia. And I also included the paper link and the collab demo at the bottom of this page. So if you are interested, you can play with the demo uh, maybe after this lecture. Um, I will start from the motivation. Uh, why do we want 
to build a foundation model and why I want it to be open source. And then I will introduce some of the design choices and also um, some of the results. Uh, finally, I can show the demo uh, with several examples. It can achieve some interesting zero-shot behavior. So firstly, um, I think in our previous lectures, we have uh, seen this general trend in speech models. We are changing from traditional machine learning to some deep learning-based systems. And we are now more interested in building end-to-end -end systems um, compared to cascaded systems. And actually, there's another recent trend that we want to move from monolingual to multilingual, from task-specific to multitask, and from some small model to bigger models that can be trained on uh, larger data. So this leads to the concept of speech foundation model. We usually um, refer to this type of model as a foundational model. Um, compared to some traditional approaches, the foundational models can have several benefits. Um, these are my opinions. So firstly, it usually improves the performance. This is mainly because the model is trained on uh, more sufficient data. It has a larger capacity because of the larger model size. And also, we are combining multiple languages and multiple tasks, so we can benefit from the cross-lingual and cross-task knowledge transfer. Another benefit is that it's usually easier to develop and deploy uh, such a multitask model because we no longer need to train separate models for different data, for different tasks, or different languages. Instead, we just combine all the data and train a single model. And this model architecture is also usually quite a standard. Uh, we don't need uh, too much tuning on it. Among all these um, popular speech foundation models, I think OpenAI's Whisper is probably the most well-known one. It was released about one year ago, and it already got uh, nearly 800 citations as of today. So for a speech paper, this is already very amazing. Um, in terms of the architecture, I think there's nothing special. It's just a standard transformer encoder decoder, which most of you have implemented in the coding assignment. Uh, it's basically the same thing. Um, but it combines multiple speech-to-text uh, conversion tasks, including speech recognition, speech translation, language identification, and utterance level alignment. Um, the difficult theme for this project is that um, we was trained on a huge amount of label speech data. In the initial version, they used 180,000 hours. And recently, they, uh, they upgraded to a new version, which was trained on 1 million plus 4 million hours. Um, and this is very huge, because like in the coding assignment 4, you were using only 100 hours. And this one is um, maybe 7,000 times larger. Um, Whisper generally achieves very good performance, especially on the high resource languages and tasks. Um, but there are some limitations. In our project, we focus on uh, one specific limitation, which is um, the open source issue. So basically, Whisper released their inference code and the model checkpoints, um, but we cannot access their training data. We don't know how they collected the data and what are included in the training sets. And we also don't know how to train um, so this can cause several concerns. Uh, firstly, if we want to use Whisper for our own task, especially if we want to apply it to some new test set, we can easily encounter data leakage issue because we don't know how the model is trained, on which data it is trained. And this may be um, cheating in some cases. And this has become a um, popular debate, even in the uh, large language model, uh, research community because they are facing the same issue. 
And the second problem is that, um, as some of you might know, uh, these models are very large and the training data is very diverse. It combines multiple tasks and uh, it's usually very noisy. Training a model of this type of data is not an easy task. Um, so without knowing the training dynamics, it is very difficult for the other people to reproduce this type of work and to further improve the performance. And thirdly, um, this can cause some robustness, fairness, or bias issue. And this is also a very important problem nowadays. And this often comes from the training process. That means we need to understand how the model is trained, on which data it is trained, in order to improve the robustness, fairness, and so on. So inspired by this, um, we started this project and we aim to promote transparency and promote open science in large scale speech pre-training. Okay, uh, next I will talk about our uh, model. Uh, first, I, I would like to give a high level overview of our model. So it is an open whisper style speech model. And we train it on a publicly available ASR and SD data. It is implemented in an open source toolkit, uh, ESPNet, and we have released all the training logs and the training code um, so that others can easily um, analyze, analyze our uh, model. Um, for the tasks, um, we basically follow the design of Whisper. Um, but uh, for the model architecture, we tried to, uh, we tried several modifications. Uh, firstly, we extended to from any to English translation to any to any language translation. Um, this is quite straightforward, and the performance actually depends on the training data. Um, to improve the efficiency, uh, we increased the down sample ratio in the encoder side. This means for a, a given input, our output length will be shorter than the original whisper. And the shorter lens will reduce the computation in self-attention. Uh, so this can improve the overall training efficiency. And also we uh, applied the hybrid CDC attention training. Um, that was introduced in previous lectures. So this can improve the convergence of the model and also improves the performance of certain tasks. Um, so our model generally achieves good performance, especially for the high resource uh, languages and tasks. And sometimes it's even better than Whisper. But we still need to improve it on some low resource tasks. Um, I guess some of you are not familiar with the Whisper design. So I will spend some time introduce how the Whisper is designed. Um, Basically, Whisper combines different types of speech to text tasks uh, in a unified format. And uh, here I'm showing the text format. So that means we have a speech input and we want to generate this text in an autoregressive manner. Uh, this is a standard autoregressive decoder, or we can call it a language model. It performs some conditional generation. So it models the conditional probability of the actual transcription given some uh, text condition. Specifically, uh, we have a special token denoting the start of sentence. And we have another special token denoting the end of sentence. In between, we concatenate multiple including sentences for a language tag for the task and actual tag only trans and everything is concatenated in a single dimension. And for inference, I am showing one example here. Um, so first we extract the speech features, feed it into the encoder and we get the encoder outputs. This will be used by the decoder through cross attention. Uh, this is also same as the coding assignment for. 
For auto regressive decoding, uh, we start from a special token, SOS, start of sentence. And then we generate the first prediction. Here it is a special tag denoting the language. We want to know uh, the language of the input speech. And then we append it to the input. Uh, so the input now has a length of two. Previously, it's just a single token. And we also append a special task token, uh, which tells the model that we want to perform speech recognition now. And then it starts to generate the actual prediction. Um, here, we also include the timestamp. This is the start timestamp uh, for the first utterance. Uh, this, and then we just repeat the process and generate. Uh, Finally, we we will generate an end of sentence token and we stop the decoding. Um, so here you may notice that we are predicting the timestamps, but why do we need the timestamps? It's actually mainly used for uh, long form decoding. Long form decoding is a bit different from what we have seen in previous lectures. So usually we pre-segment all the data and the input is only a single utterance. Um, but suppose we have a very long audio, say one hour long, how can we transcribe it? Uh, there are several strategies. The simplest strategy might be that we just throw the input to some pre-trained model and see what happens. And usually this will cause auto memory issue because the model just cannot handle um, this long data. And also this has a mismatch between the train and the inference. During training, the model is usually trained on some short segments. So it cannot generalize well to the long uh, input at the inference time. Another approach, which is um, most widely used solution right now is to pre-segment the data and transcribe each segment and concatenate all the transcriptions. Uh, to achieve this, uh, we need to detect a speech versus non-speech area uh, region. So this is called a voice activity detection. Uh, it usually works well, yeah. But in Whisper, they adopt a different approach which is to jointly predict the timestamps. Um, so next, I, I will show how we perform this window inference with predicted time information. Um, firstly, we have this uh, very long audio. And our model is trained on some short segments. Like in Whisper, the model is trained on 30 second window. It's a fixed size window. So firstly, we just take the first 30 seconds send this into the model and generate the hypothesis. This hypothesis includes the start and the end timestamp for each utterance. Um, in this first example, the first sentence starts from zero second and ends at uh, around 14 seconds. The following utterance starts from 15 seconds and ends at about 27. Now we know when it ends, uh, we can shift the window based on this predicted timestamp. We just shift the window to 27 seconds and then continue this decoding process. For the second window, we also generate a hypothesis with all the timestamps. And we know when it ends, we shift it again and we get the third window, the third prediction. Finally, to get the full transcription of the entire input audio, we just concatenate all the short segments. And this also tells us how the text is aligned with the uh, input audio in an utterance level. Okay, so um, for our experiments, we considered the three setups. Uh, we gradually increased the data and the model size. And uh, finally, we reached uh, the size of the whisper media model, but our data is still much smaller and more efforts are required. Um, here I'm showing our uh, training data. 
for the V1 version, we have 38,000 hours, about 22 languages. And then we increase um, the data for these high resource languages, uh, mainly for the English, Chinese. Um, so it goes up to more than 100,000. And then we extend it to include more languages, um, especially for multilingual speech recognition. And it goes to about 180,000. Um, next, I will show some results of our model uh, compared to the OpenAI's whisper. Uh, first uh, result is on English ASR. So the first column is OpenAI's whisper small. Second column is the median. And the following three columns are our three versions. The gray color uh, means that uh, the model performance is better than the whisper. So actually, um, our model can achieve reasonable performance in most of the benchmarks. And it is even better than whisper in select benchmarks. And note that our training data is only about um, 25%, a quarter of the data used for um, whisper. So this is already quite encouraging result. For the multilingual ASR, a uh, general finding is that the performance highly correlates with the training data size. For some languages like Japanese, uh, we have sufficient training data, so we can achieve very good performance. But for some languages, the training data is very limited and the performance is not that good. For speech translation, uh, as I mentioned before, Whisper only supports any to English translation, and we extend it to uh, more translation directions. And the finding is also similar. The performance highly correlates with the training data size. For some language detect, uh, directions, we have more than 10,000 hours of data, and we can achieve a reasonable uh, translation score. But in some cases, the training data is very limited. Uh, so it almost doesn't work. We also evaluated the model on language identification. Um, so that means for a given input utterance, we want to classify it into one of the uh, predefined languages. And our model is actually uh, quite good, performs quite well. Uh, this is because we support more languages in the training data. I also included uh, two examples for the timestamp prediction. Um, the input is a fixed length 30 second audio segment. And we run the model using greedy search. The first column is uh, uh, the ground truth from some TED Talk corpus. And the second column is our prediction. Um, if we compare the two results, uh, we can see that the timestamp is usually accurate. Uh, but note that uh, utterance is not a well-defined uh, concept. So you can have different definitions for utterance. You can merge some consecutive utterances to form a longer utterance. And also the um, timestamp is usually not that accurate, even for the ground truth. It may include some silence um, at the beginning or after some utterance. So considering uh, all of these, our performance is quite good. This also means that the model, the decoder actually knows when to generate a, a timestamp token. It has the sense of uh, some timing information. So um, I also listed several future directions. Um, I think there are mainly maybe three directions. First is to improve the efficiency. Um, but currently the model is quite large and the inference can be very slow. So how to compress the model uh, can be a very practical issue. And recently, Hacking Face released a paper to distill whisper layers. 
and it works uh, well on ASR task. It can achieve some good uh, uh, speed up. And the second direction is to improve the performance. We can try more advanced encoder architecture. Uh, we are already trying this and got some good results. And we can also try some self-supervised pre-training to utilize more data. And we also need to improve, uh, improve the uh, training data quality. This is a very important issue. And finally, um, we need to think about what we can get uh, from this type of work. Like in large language models, um, scaling up can give you some benefits, like emergent capabilities. But uh, how about uh, for speech? Can we get something similar? I think all these are not well.